All right, hello. We'll get started in just a minute. Welcome to the webinar. Still see some folks are funneling in. Okay, I think we can get started. So uh, I'm Joe Offenberg. I'm an outbound product manager here with ServiceNow, and I'm here with uh, Tamim Harani from uh, RapDev, one of my favorite partners in the uh, in the ServiceNow uh, sphere of influence. And uh, today we're going to talk about RapDev's newest service offering in the ServiceNow store, Lean into DevOps. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. And let's get started. So yeah, we're going to start with the challenges as we usually do with these kind of things. And uh, then we'll uh, actually talk about the uh, uh, the solution itself and we'll give you a live demo. And, and, and along the way, we're going to do some polling. Uh, and uh, then uh, we'll do some Q&A. We'll give you an opportunity to ask some questions, okay? So a little background on myself, I came to uh, ServiceNow a couple of years ago with the acquisition of a, a product called Swigle. Uh, we had a DevOps configuration data management platform that's now been replatformed into ServiceNow as, as uh, DevOps config. Uh, and that's one of the many uh, solutions that uh, Tamim and his team over there at RapDev can help you with. And uh, really happy to introduce Tamim uh, Again, uh, one of my favorite partners in this uh, in this industry here. Tamim, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Joe. Hey guys, my name is Tamim Harani. Um, some familiar familiar names on the attendee list. So good to see you guys again. Um, solutions engineer, RapDev. Prior to joining RapDev, I ran production engineering at Wayfair for about three years, where we use ServiceNow in a kind of very unorthodox ways. And one of the byproducts of that was uh, the, the DevOps module. So uh, excited to be working with, with uh, Joe and the ServiceNow team on building out the product and uh, implementing it. Great. So I would say it's probably been about five or six years now since customers uh, started coming to us with this problem where uh, they started using uh, DevOps pipelines to move their uh, applications into production. So what this meant where they were making small incremental changes continuously to production and our uh, Traditional change management process wasn't really built for 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 small incremental changes happening continuously. You know there were uh, long waits and in, in you know for the cab approval board and for uh, uh, all the ana analytics that need to be done and the impact analysis. And uh, we had to solve this problem at ServiceNow. And uh, at the time, we didn't have a lot of skills on the DevOps side. So uh, you know, with one particular customer. Uh, we, they, we, we, we were introduced to a partner there, RapDev, uh, who uh, was also a ServiceNow partner for some other solutions. And uh, it, was, it was really, uh, and, and then the, all the, uh, the DevOps solutions uh, we worked on together to, to create the change velocity solution and then eventually bring that to market. So to me, why don't you go ahead and uh, sure. tell us what it's all about. Yeah, right on. Um, so uh, like uh, Joe said, we're a ServiceNow partner. Uh, we're the only uh, partner that has the DevOps PLA, and if, for those of you not familiar, it's the product line achievement, which essentially means we've done enough implementations of uh, the DevOps module um, that ServiceNow trusts us to deploy these uh, without them. Um, we've uh, got over seven different um, um, uh, deployment modules on the ServiceNow store and uh, four integrations that are standalone, so things like chat ops, things like integrations with info blocks and others. Um, the general uh, thesis for RapDev is we're uh, on a mission to make ServiceNow seamless for modern ephemeral workloads. Think cloud native, think microservices, uh, think of very uh, dynamic uh, CMDB CIs. Uh, we want to make sure that works seamlessly uh, for ServiceNow customers today. 
Um, some of our customers, uh, just a quick touch uh, from Raptive. These are a few of the logos. Obviously, I'm going to run through them. But you could probably see a pattern of highly regulated customers, especially when it comes to the ServiceNow uh, DevOps module. And the reason being is that the high regulatory requirements uh, tend to slow down a lot of the, the deployment velocity and our customers' ability to get code to production faster. Uh, so using the DevOps module, we've able, been able to automate a lot of those audit requirements. Uh, so that's uh, a reason for kind of the, the gravitating towards some of the more highly regulated customers. Um, we're going to turn it back over to Joe for a quick poll. Uh, and uh, as we go through these guys, please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A or the chat. I'm not sure which one's working, but don't wait till the end. If something pops up and you've got an idea or a question, um, it's a lot more fun for us uh, to interact with you guys as we go through this. So uh, Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so I think the uh, the first poll is just to get an understanding, you know, from the audience. Uh, where are you on the on your DevOps adoption journey today? Uh, you know, we we know there are, there are a lot of different levels of maturity out there for DevOps, and uh, we'd like to know where we stand with this group here. You have another yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah. Is that good? I think we're good. And where are the results? Oh, oh, wow. It's a pretty even distribution, I would say. And I would also say 12 of you did not take the poll. So please take the poll next time. Uh, it's just too <laughs> quick. But yeah, that is very interesting. Um, pretty even spread. Very cool. Yep. Uh, so let's carry on. Um, <clears throat> DevOps for the modern enterprise. So as we go through kind of what DevOps means for modern enterprise or what we've come to learn working with customers, uh, there's a few different themes that have emerged. Um, one, of the, one of the bigger themes is um, the autonomy of allowing engineers to use their own tools uh, presents its own challenges in the way of audit requirements and change management. Um, because there are different tools being used, different CICD tools, different uh, testing tools, et cetera, uh, those data sets tend to be more disparate and fragmented. Um, which then leads you to no easy way to track performance across different teams, especially as uh, development organizations start to grow to 100, 200, 500 engineers. Um, you kind of want need a way to track that. Some of you might be familiar with the Accelerate KPIs, also known as the Dora metrics. Um, in order to collect that data and track it, you need a central repo, at least for the metadata, not for the tool set themselves. And we all know on this call, or if we've been engineers in the past, Adding process and adding gates is not a good way to do this. Um, slowing down developers is never an option. So how do we achieve true CICD, true high velocity uh, without slowing down developers? That's something that we're hopefully walk you through today. Um, a lot of the goals our customers run into is we need to deploy code faster. I'm sure you've heard that a million times. Uh, we need to do uh, faster reverts. We need to do reduced deployment risks. Historically, this was always achieved using a very strict and rigid change approval policy. Um, that's no longer an option. If you've got a developer that needs to deploy code two or three times a day to production, um, in a past life, we were deploying at Wayfair 600 times a day to production. You cannot manually submit a change record for every single deploy. So how do we find the middle grounds um, and how do we achieve true velocity? So again, another poll, this time we have 30 people. Let's try to get a little more than uh, 20 responses, but Joe, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure, okay. so. Uh, we know how important the uh, CAB is to traditional uh, change management, right? So today, do you feel your weekly CAB meeting is, is outputting effectively? Or how effective is your weekly CAB meeting as preventing outages? In other words, is, and full disclosure, we changed this question last minute, which is why it's a little jumbled. How effective is your weekly CAB at preventing outages is the question. Uh, yes, they are. No, they're not. Sometimes, or I don't know. And we've got a few more participants this time. So hopefully get closer to, to 30, maybe 25 votes considering the panelists are on. And 10 more seconds. We need Jeopardy music next time. Yeah, that would be good. Bring my Bose speaker. And guys uh, that joined us a little more uh, recently, please uh, drop your questions in the chat or Q&A. Uh, again, I'm not sure which one works but we'd love to hear from you as we go through these. Don't wait till the end. Right, All here right. are our results. 
Interesting. Right. So, so forty percent say yes, thirty five percent say sometimes, and one person said no, they don't. So that's probably an engineer or a developer would be my guess. <laughs> yeah, somebody is trying to get their changes into production, right? Yeah. So very interesting, guys. So right, the 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 spread seems to be uh, the challenges we run into is cab tends to slow things down, which in turn does prevent outages. But how do we how do we find a balance between uh, a modern, let's call it cap, and allowing engineers to deploy code uh, as needed whenever they need to go to production. And that's what we're going to run through today. Um, ServiceNow, uh, generally think of it as a hub. So we're not saying ServiceNow is replacing any of your CI, CD, or DevOps tools. ServiceNow is not designed to replace any of those tools. ServiceNow is designed to be a layer at the bottom that's a hub for all your tools to interact with, to drive your ITSM, modern cloud-native ITSM processes, and ultimately be a seamless uh, integration point for all these tools. If we do this right, and uh, this is a line I'm very, very particular on, developers should not know that ServiceNow is part of the picture. If everything's working right, you're either using uh, your chat ops tools, such as uh, Slack or Microsoft Teams to interact with uh, ServiceNow, or all your tools are integrated to ServiceNow on the back end. So we do a good job here. ServiceNow should be uh, seamless, and we'll show you how that works in a moment. Um, important touch point here. I touched on velocity a couple of times earlier. The shift in kind of modern tech stacks is moving away from slowing down uh, change and moving away from controlling change and moving the focus towards the emphasis on the ability to revert a change. So using strong engineering practices and using uh, good code hygiene in production, we're able to use things like blue green deploys, canary deploys, uh, different types of deployment methods to revert any bad deploys that happen. So this allows us to use objective risk analysis for the change but also gives us some bolts and nuts such as feature toggles to revert bad code changes that do happen in production quickly and effectively, resulting in the same very low mean time to, mean time to response, but we're just doing it through technology and engineering versus doing it through a heavy process. Um, successful deploys for uh, DevOps, um, generally at three high level um, pillars you wanna think about, right? Traceability who deployed what, when, and this is really important for auditors as well. As I said earlier, a lot of our customers tend to be more highly regulated. So uh, what tests ran, what artifacts do we have against uh, uh, evidence that might be required for a pharma company, pharmaceutical, for example, um, making sure that we can tie that all together from when the story is created to when it goes to production. The second one, objective risk analysis. I've been an engineer. I've submitted changes that are low risk, low impact, just to make sure I don't have to go to cab. I'm sure there's a few people on this call that have done the same thing. How do we prevent that? And how do we use the data within the platform to determine the objective risk of that inherent change? We don't want to leave it to the engineer to decide if it's uh, risky or not. And also, uh, uh, we can't expect our um, cab managers to know every single detail about every single technology. We need to use the data where we can. And the third bullet is what I alluded to earlier around process improvement across the org. Uh, which is using things like Dora metrics and Accelerate metrics. And for those of you that are not familiar, there, there are four metrics that have really uh, become uh, the cornerstone of measuring developer performance, developer velocity uh, within the tech environment. Uh, anything you want to add, Joe, that I missed here? No, I mean, that's absolutely right. The, you know, developer, the development time is probably one of the most closely tracked resources uh, in any organization. And if we can give them a lot of that time back, so they're spending more time enhancing the applications and fixing the bugs, then uh, they're more than happy to uh, to allow their uh, their pipelines to be tracked in service now. And, uh, th and that's been the experience so far. So right on. pretty well. Awesome. Yeah. Um, you want to run, run us through uh, the positioning, Joe, and then we can uh, dive into a demo, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, as I was just saying, developers, they don't like logging into ServiceNow. They don't like having to open a change record. Uh, often the change managers are stuck in the middle uh, trying to get more data from the DevOps processes and, and the auditors trying to get more data from them. So this solution really um, allows us to passively collect the data from their tools, right? So uh, without them having to uh, you know, spend a lot of time providing it for and for those change records. And and also, once we have that data, once we have them in, in, in the uh, platform, we can provide them for analysis. Uh, we can provide some really nice dashboards, the Dora metrics that to me mentioned. We also now have the flow metrics, 
which are value stream management metrics as well. And uh, so identifying which teams could benefit the most from you know, this type of automation will become pretty clear pretty quickly. And then uh, what uh, Tamim and his team can do is, is really uh, one, help, uh, help these teams adopt uh, this type of process and this type of automation, as well as uh, even improve some of the DevOps processes and help on some of the DevOps, the maturity on the DevOps side. Uh, to to make it most beneficial for everybody. So, uh, if this is done right, you know, developers will never have to log into ServiceNow again, and that makes them very happy. And that that makes uh, the the whole operation run a lot smoother. And, and getting fixes out to your application and and responding to your business becomes yep. uh, a much better process. Right on. Yeah. Um, thanks a ton, Joe. We have two questions that came in. I'll give you the first one. I can answer the second. The first one's from Alex P. Hey guys, thanks a ton for putting questions in. Please keep them coming. Uh, these are the that is the fun part of this webinar. Alex P is asking: Are risk assessments configurable? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we give you some data points with the installation, and uh, but any data in the platform, any indicators in the platform, or even outside the platform, and this is where the the skills from uh, RapDev will really come in handy. Uh, can be used uh, in the risk assessment and in the uh, automated approval process. So the answer to that question is absolutely yes. And, and Alex, uh, in the demo, we'll uh, touch on that and show you where you could set the policies, configure the policies, et cetera. Um, the second question, RF Moen says, um, excellent content. Thank you so much, RF. Uh, how does the platform provide for IAC, config management, uh, supporting common languages, monitoring, observability, et cetera, et cetera? Um, that's a very broad, very broad uh, question. There's a lot of different areas we can plug that in, and I'm going to touch on some of them today, but it might make sense. Uh, we have a separate offering called the uh, cloud native uh, operations uh, that touches a lot of that. So tag-based service mapping, using tags for observability, managing your CMDB through YAML files for infrastructure as code. There's a lot of different components that tie together uh, what the platform can do. Uh, DevOps config is the, uh, the, uh, the predecessor to what we're going to show here. And that touches a lot on uh, managing infrastructure code. That's where Joe came from, actually, Swiegel. Um, but if you don't mind, we'll probably grab your information, set up another follow-up. And that, there's a lot to cover on that topic in the way of cloud native uh, service now. Also, if you're going to be at Knowledge this year, uh, we have a few sessions, RapDev and uh, ServiceNow, Joe might be in a couple of them, where we're running through some customer examples of how we do uh, cloud native uh, ServiceNow or cloud native operations for ServiceNow. Uh, feel free to reach out and uh, we'll get you hooked up there. You're welcome, RF. I just got to thank you. Um, so I will flag those as answered. But like I said, guys, please uh, send over any other questions you may have and we'll uh, continue pressing on here. Uh, all right, time for a demo. So um, we're going to run you through a demo of the uh, ServiceNow DevOps module. Uh, for today's demo, I'm going to uh, use uh, uh, ADO, Azure DevOps, as our platform. And as Joe showed us earlier, all of the tools within ADO are going to be uh, plugged into uh, ServiceNow. So the way I'm going to run the demo, this is really important. I'm going to do a day in the life of a developer. So what that means is I'm going to go from creating a story, making a commit, running a pipeline, and then getting that code to production. And I'm going to do all of that without touching ServiceNow. And the idea is to show you how a developer can actually generate a change, get it approved, and get to production without having to touch ServiceNow. Once that's done, I'm then going to flip over to ServiceNow and walk you through exactly what just happened. Uh, and again, like I said earlier, feel free to throw questions in the chat, um, and uh, we'll answer them as they come up. So. The first thing I'm going to do is create a story. Um, we're just going to create a bug here, and I'm going to call it um, Alex P. Loves Service Now because he asked the first question today. And we're going to save it. And now I've got an ID. And uh, some of you might be familiar with the notion of smart commits. Uh, essentially, it's uh, tagging your commits with actual stories. Very standard practice in um, modern development cycles. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to make. A, I'm going to modify this file called test. And I'm going to add a bunch of lines, line one, line two, webinars are awesome, line four, and then a thank you for Alex P again. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and make this commit. And I'm going to be presented with uh, the commit message, right, or comments. Uh, I could do, go about this two ways. I could either uh, 
bring up the story I just created here and uh, address it in ADO. Now, some of you might be using uh, GitHub, Bitbucket, other tools. The same rule applies for smart commits. All you'd have to do is add the smart commit to the beginning of your message and ServiceNow is smart enough to parse out exactly what you're doing, which we don't need to do here, but I just wanted to touch that. Um, once we make this commit within ADO, I've got a pipeline that dynamically uh, kicks off. So I can look at my commit and I can see uh, what pipeline is running. And if we jump over here, we can see that a build is uh, about to start. And once the build starts, uh, this will start to track. Here we go, started three seconds ago. This will start to track within ServiceNow. So far as a developer, I've created a story, I've made a commit, I've kicked off a pipeline. And in order to go to production, we need to change record, right? So what's gonna happen now is all of my systems are hooked into ServiceNow to generate a change, approve the change, and then come back out to uh, ADO. Now, let's say as a developer, I wanna know what's going on in ServiceNow. Instead of logging into ServiceNow, we have our ServiceNow instance hooked into Slack. And this is where ChatOps comes into play. Very important concept with allowing your engineers to not have to log into ServiceNow. Uh, you hook ServiceNow into uh, Slack, Microsoft Teams, uh, WebEx Teams, any chat tool that you might be using. And that allows us to uh, receive information from ServiceNow, but also interact with ServiceNow if necessary. So as a developer, I might have made a commit. I'm working on something else. This is a channel I have that's going to give me uh, all of my uh, responses to the ob objective risk analysis we were talking about earlier. And Alex uh, P, to answer your question, these are the conditions we've got for the current approval policy. Once this runs, makes its way over to uh, ServiceNow, I'll jump to ServiceNow and show you exactly what that looks like. But this is the output of the approval policy. And this is what's going to tell us this change requires a manual approval, such as here, because something failed, or this change was auto-approved. So uh, and what you have there is a good combination of uh, operational stability, right? Are there any incidents or outages going on? Uh, development best practices, making sure that uh, you know code is checked in the right way and, and they're following best practices there and, and you know, their branch protection is turned on all of those things. And then of course, security, right? You wanna make sure there are no vulnerabilities and the security scans came back good. Uh, all of those things make their way into, into that checklist, yeah. Totally, yeah, right on. Um, so if I go back to my pipeline, I can look at my UAT deploy and it looks like we're just finalizing that. All right, so if I go here, I see that the pipeline ran, my deploy was uh, uh, went through. I, I can see all my interactions with ServiceNow. Now let's go back over here and I get the actual output. So you see at 222, which is the time in Boston right now, a change got created by me because I made the, the change. It was auto approved because nothing was out of character and uh, the change was submitted to ServiceNow. So as a developer, I built my seat, I built, made my commit, built my story, sent it over, and then full circle, my deploy went to production. And I know that my change was created and approved and I'm all set. Now let's say that the change wasn't approved and I do need to go to uh, ServiceNow to approve something. You can still do that within ChatOps. So if you look here, this is a bot we've created um, that uses ServiceNow and Slack as a method of input. Super important for engineers as well. If you do need to approve a change, or reject a change, you can do that directly from Slack. You do not need to log into ServiceNow to interact with those changes. ChatOps is a very important notion of kind of cloud native uh, operations, cloud native workflows. It can apply to change, it can apply to major incidents, creating channels, adding users to channels, updating records, creating problems. This is a really, really big game changer in the way of cloud native uh, operations. So I'm gonna pause here. Um, any questions before I jump into ServiceNow and show you what exactly happened behind the scenes, right? I'm a developer, I got my code to production, I'm done. And now I'm gonna take you over to ServiceNow. So before I do that, anything that you want me to touch on? Drop it in the chat, we'll give it 30 seconds. Cool, I must've done a great job at this demo. Crystal clear. All righty, so let's jump over to ServiceNow and take a look at what's going on. Um, I'm going to end with the dashboard because that's where the Dora metrics are uh, portrayed, but let's follow the same exact flow. So the first thing I did was make a commit. So if you see this menu here, every single commit that happens in any of your tools will get logged by ServiceNow. Important to note, we're not logging the actual code by default. We're just log logging the metadata of the commit. 
So how many lines were created? I get a link back if I ever need it. Um, which branch this commit's part of right here. And then which work items or which stories were part of this commit. So this is really important because when we get to the change record, you'll see that all of these artifacts are actually attached to the change itself. So every commit that happens is constantly being logged into ServiceNow and then dot walked back into the change record itself. So now that we've got the commit, let's go look at the story. Um, as you saw me creating the story, I typed out Alex P loves ServiceNow because Alex P asked us our first question today. So thank you, Alex. Uh, but you can see that this is all being brought into ServiceNow in real time. Um, there's no custom integrations here. There's nothing that has to be done out of, uh, that's non out of the box. This is all out of box integrations to ServiceNow. And again, as stories get created, we're collecting them. Super important thing to note is we're linking all of the commits with ServiceNow stories through the commit message. Uh, so this is where you start to plug in different uh, commits. You can have 10 commits, 20 commits per story that ultimately make it over to uh, ServiceNow and help us create the change. Um, sweet, we've got some questions coming through. I'm gonna pause here and answer a question. First one's from Derek. Have you experimented with a Kafka events-driven integration model versus directly integrating ServiceNow events to pipeline tools? Absolutely. Um, I'll take that one, Joe, I'll give you the next one. Uh, we've done uh, several implementations using Kafka event topics, not only for DevOps, you could use them for events, you could use them for uh, different cloud events. So scaling up, scaling down, elasticity, uh, there's tons of different use cases for having Kafka topics being sent into ServiceNow. And we actually do have, it might be open sourced. Uh, we do have a Kafka integration for ServiceNow where you can hook a specific topic to a bus and uh, gather whatever uh, events you're interested in. It might be in our uh, open source GitHub, uh, Derek, if you just Google ServiceNow GitHub open source, sorry, RapDev GitHub open source, you might find it there. If not, feel free to hit us up and I'll make sure to get you a copy of it. But yes, very good use case that we have used. Um, and I'll flag that as answered. Next question, Joe, if you want to take this one. Uh, Vishnu says, what about licensing? Does, does all ServiceNow licenses have these features? So the ITSM Pro license is, is where you'll find the uh, the features that we're showing you here. It's a DevOps change velocity and DevOps config are included in ITSM Pro. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. And thank you, Vishnu. Thank you, Derek. Um, I will flag those as answered. And guys, uh, continue to send them over. So uh, we'll hop back to our demo. We've got a work item. This is the story that came from ADO. And now let's go look at the outcome, right? So we've got the commit, we've got the story. Uh, let's go look at what exactly happened when the pipeline ran. And that's gonna be really where the magic happens, right? So if we come in here and we do this, and we look at our most recent change, which is going to be this one. And just to clarify, I'm going to confirm as a developer, um, I was the change that got generated for me was uh, 621. And if I come back here, I look for change 621. That's the one. So let's click on it and let's take a look at what exactly happened here. Uh, it took 44 seconds to run. These are all my pipeline steps. And in the background, a very important differentiation here, especially for those of us that have been in the change world for a while. This is not a standard change. This is not a pre-approved change. We don't want to pre-approve anything because there's a lot of different variables that can go into play deploying a change. We're, we're automatically approving a change. So an auto-approval versus a pre-approval. We're using conditions to dictate if this change can be auto-approved. And those conditions must be met in order for the change to be approved. As opposed to historically, we've done standard changes for things that are very simple, things that are repetitive. We don't want to do that here. That is too risky. So let's take a look at our change standard stuff here. The most important component is right at the bottom. Uh, we'll look, take a look at our commits. Within the change record itself, we have a list of all the commits that went to production. We have a list of all the stories that made up this change. So what are the stories that are being worked on that are going to production? Any tests that ran. So if we have JUnit tests, you have security scans, you've got any sorts of uh, testing requirements that have been uh, imposed either by your engineering teams or by your auditors can all be uh, listed here and all the results are here. So in the future, an auditor says, hey, show me all the tests that ran for this deploy. They're in one place. And finally, artifacts. So a result of your pipeline is always gonna be an artifact of sorts. It could be a zip, could be a jar, could be a, a, any sort of code-based artifact that gets deployed. That's also listed here in track. 
So what we have in this particular change record is all of the different artifacts or components that made up the change. This is, uh, does it show which conditions have been met? Yes, it absolutely does. I'll show you that in a moment, Alex. Um, this, is what, this is what shows us all the different components that went to production in a single change record. Historically, a developer would have to do this manually, go to CAB, get their approval, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here, we're doing this uh, through a single automated objective-based approval policy. Um, any questions on the change record itself before I pull up the conditions that Alex is referencing? Cool. Um, so Alex, uh, Alex's question just came up. Does it show which conditions have been met or have not been met? And the answer is yes. And let me show you how we set those conditions right here. And Alex, also to answer your question, allowing the developer to know what was met and what was not met should be exposed through chat ops. So here, these are the these are the conditions that were are required in order for the change to get approved. And his, here's the one that failed. The total changes are negative one. We have zero failed tests, zero, zero failed Swigo tests, zero, zero commits without stories, the list goes on. But we do have the total changes negative one, which is why this failed. The developer can easily go back and, uh, and fix their commit. And here's how we configured them. So if we look at, uh, if we look at these uh, conditions here, this is a single policy. Uh, we can have multiple policies applied to a single pipeline. We generally recommend uh, a global policy, which applies to everyone in an org, and then sometimes team-based policies based on the severity or the impact of the application itself that's being worked on. But this, this is where you define the config checks, total changes, any problem tasks. And the really cool thing here, which is really important to harp on, the value you get from doing this in ServiceNow versus a standard gate in the pipeline is ServiceNow has two more contexts that you do not get in your pipeline. The first one is operational context. Has there been any P1s against this service in the last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, et cetera? All that operational information that lives in ServiceNow can now be part of the decision. And the second component is the organizational information. Is Joe an intern? Is Joe Has Joe been at the organization for more than 90 days? All of that organizational persona data could be used as a part of your policy. I would even add one more. I would say governance. If you if they've implemented GRC, there are regulatory requirements, you know, uh, SOX requirements and GDPR requirements that can be tied in as well. So uh, you can get really sophisticated with this, and it's and it, once the data is in the platform, it's very easy to uh, to adapt it. Totally. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but I think we are going to start shipping some out of box policies, right? That are tailored towards SOC 2 or PII or HIPAA, so things like that. Basically, some of the more standard policies. That, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, right on. Awesome. Um, a bunch of questions came in. Let's pause here and take these. I'll give you the first one, Joe. I've been talking too much. Uh, Cheryl Lopes or Lopez, sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, I assume that specific required fields on the change form will be included. In our case, assigned to is required, but is not required on your screen. You want to take that one? You know, if you've customized your change form, and you know this is where um, this is where RapDev can really help you, right? Because uh, we we do require certain fields, and we do fill in certain fields. But then, if you've added additional fields that now need to be filled in, that'll take a little bit of extra work. Uh, you'll have to go into the backend flow uh, and and add those fields. I mean, if the data is available, it's 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 not much work at all. But if you've done some customization on your change uh, management process and added additional fields, then yes, you 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 know we'll have to get that data into the record. Yep. Cheryl, sure, hope uh, that answers your question. If not, feel free to drop us another one. Uh, another one from Arif. Uh, super engaged today. Thank you, Arif. Uh, we appreciate it. The question is: Is there visibility for audit? from code running in production to the deployment pipeline and policy results. You want to take that one, Joe? That's some of the newer stuff that's being released. Um, can I, you repeat this? Yeah. yeah. So the question is, is there visibility from code running in production to the deployment pipeline and the policy results? So the artifact, right? Which artifact got, got deployed and how we tag that? I can take it. Um, so one of, the, one of the shifts in the CMDB, again, this is part of the broader topic, Arif, and you're asking all the good questions, all the right questions. One of the shifts in the way we track uh, CIs in the CMDB is, is essentially what's driving CSDM4, 
But a lot of these workloads are ephemeral. A lot of these CIs are short-lived. They're not there forever. They're not static. So what happens is as these artifacts or what you're calling code get deployed to production, we have to tag the versions of the artifacts against the application services. So once something gets deployed, within the CMDB, we update the CMDB to say, this is the current artifact version in production for this particular application service. And then you can easily link that artifact. And I had it here, I can show you. Um, that artifact can very easily get linked back to the change, which is also linked to the code and all of the policies that ran against that code. So the, the key is to tie the artifact deployable to the application service that's running. And you can very easily find that in your change record here. Hey, and that becomes super important. Uh, you know, we know there are tools that, that show us when there are vulnerabilities in the artifacts and those are DevOps tools we integrate with as well, like JFrog uh, um, X-Ray, for example. So knowing where those artifacts are deployed and when they were deployed, and then understanding, hey, some of these artifacts might have uh, the log4j vulnerability, for example, you know, we we can close that loop. We can tell you exactly where those artifacts are and when they were deployed and exactly. give you a quick way to, to, to remediate that. And RF, just to point you here, this is the artifact version that's also attached to the change. And this artifact version in particular is what's going to get updated on the uh, application service in your CMDB. And that's what the CSDM4 model is really trying to enforce. And because you have the artifact version, you know the tests that ran, you know the work items, you know the commits, and you can really look for any of those uh, artifacts you're looking for. This demo is very short. And when you get to production changes, you're going to have a lot more commits, many more work items. It, the tests are a lot more granular. But the concept is the same. The artifact is what's linking you to the um, to the test up front. And I, I, should also, I should also add with DevOps config, we, we bring that concept to actually config data. So uh, the snapshot of config data becomes versioned. And if there's a, a vulnerability because of a config data setting, right, uh, not not a, a, a code issue, but a config issue, uh, you'll be able to track that down as well by linking those snapshots to where they're deployed and to the change records. Right on. Um, the last question, um, Wow, they're coming in. This is awesome. Uh, we just got another one. Let's, uh, Joe, if you want to grab this one, how is the risk of the change calculated from Brandon Foster? Yeah, so the risk of the change is is basically, uh, in, in the example that Tamim is using, uh, we have a checklist, right? And uh, we give you some basic uh, metrics and data points that you can use. One of them is uh, lines of code. You know, we know that uh, DevOps should be small incremental changes. And if the changes become too big, it becomes riskier. Another one is uh, how many commits between merges. You can use that. That's a good example because if you if you have too many commits between the merge, the merge becomes riskier. The, the merge becomes more complicated and more difficult. So these are numbers you want to keep low in, in your pipelines. And if you're going to deploy more frequently, then it becomes a lot easier to do this. Um, you also have data that's platform specific, such as the uh, the the uh, let's say error budgets. Error budgets coming from ITOM, for example, if, if if an application is close to exceeding its error budget, or if a team has historically had unsuccessful changes, right? They, they have a lot of changes that get reverted. Uh, that data is also available for the for the assessment. Yep. Awesome. Um, and if we didn't answer your question, uh, Brandon, feel free to uh, drop another note. But uh, it's super, super flexible, and it really depends on the tool set and the outcomes you're trying to, uh, the behavior you're trying to influence um, by deploying the DevOps module. Uh, one more question here, Mark Portelli. It does or can RapDev create and update the snow change request? Yes, absolutely. There's many ways to do that. Uh, the simplest is through uh, the existing integrations as part of the DevOps module. Uh, you can get into change management versus change registration. There's a lot of different ways to handle that. But the short answer is yes, 100%. Um, and happy to dive into that further if you want to shoot us an email, Mark. Um, the last component I do want to touch on real quick is the dashboards, because everybody loves pretty dashboards. Um, <clears throat> so we touched on Dora metrics several times. Really important concept uh, starting to emerge, or it really has emerged for the past two or three years within the developer community. Uh, and, and the Dora metrics or Accelerate metrics, there's a really good book called Accelerate uh, IT. Um, essentially, if you measure these four metrics and you track them across different teams or across the org, in the theory says you should become better at getting code to your customers faster. Uh, successful deployments, which is essentially successful change or failed change. 
average lead time, which is the time it takes from when a story is created until when it makes it to production. Um, mean time to resolve, we're all very familiar with that one, right? Uh, but instead of measuring troubleshooting time on an incident, we're now trying to use engineering uh, best practices to do rollbacks or reverts or feature toggles. And change failure rate uh, is essentially the last one, uh, which is uh, of the number of changes that went to production, how many did we have to roll back? Uh, those are the four high-level door metrics uh, that now you can get basically as a byproduct of having all your tools configured and all your metrics coming to service now. Obviously, you can measure these uh, at different at the repo level, at the project level, at the organizational level. It becomes very flexible in how you measure and report on these. Uh, there's a lot more in here that comes out of the box. Um, more dev insights, more deploy insights, operational stability is something you'll see more and more of uh, when the new CNO module comes out or is actually out now. Um, but all of this is available out of the box. No custom uh, metrics here. Uh, we have had customers start with just looking at these door metrics. They don't want to automate change. They don't want to go all the way there. They just want to start by understanding the performance of their developer community within the organization. And that's very achievable by simply plugging in all of your tools and starting to collect that data uh, over time. That's a good first step. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Joe, anything I missed that we need to cover here or uh, before we flip back to the slides? No, I just add that there are a lot of DevOps dashboards out there. I think what makes ours special is the is the combination of the development data and all of the operational stability data we have, and you know availability data, incidents, outages, uh, data coming in from um, the monitoring tools, understanding patterns of change and and what that impact is. I think that gives us a, a pretty good advantage over some of the other tools that are out there for just for the just for the dashboard. Agreed. Agreed. Hmm. Awesome. Um, guys, any more questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. I think we're going to end with this one slide, if I have it correct. Uh, yeah, hit us with your burning questions. And since we've been going back and forth on these, I think we're in a good place. Um, I'll keep the slide up. Uh, thank you again, guys, for joining. Uh, super engaging. Really appreciate you giving us uh, an hour of your time today. Hopefully, uh, you got out of this what you needed. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me or Joe. Um, or sales at RapDev. It's a little more generic, but if you want to get straight to us, my email is t at rapdev.io. Joe is joe.offenberg. At offenberg at servicenow.com. And uh, with that, we'll hang back for a couple minutes and see if any more questions come in. Otherwise, uh, we'll wrap it up. Well, thanks oh, for having me, Kameen. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Yeah, right on. Nikita, thanks for sharing my email with everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks, and for those, everybody. Going. Awesome, guys. Nobody wants to leave. Everyone's still on. <laughs> We're going to miss the last, uh, the epilogue here. I don't think we have any more questions. There we go. Now people are dropping. Yeah. All righty. Um, that'll be it for us, folks. Thanks again for joining and hope to talk to you all soon.